is a disease unique to humans. Why do humans get acne? Well, think about the distribution of those greasy sebaceous glands, face, chest, and back, exactly the same structures that pose the greatest obstruction during childbirth. So hey, maybe having a little extra lubrication at those sites would help make the you know, baby more slippery for birth, conferring a selective advantage for successful delivery. OK, but what triggers them to become inflamed into zits later on? While in westernized societies, acne is a nearly universal skin disease afflicting up to 95% of teens, and some populations eating more traditional diets, not even single cases could be found. Uh, this suggests that perhaps nutrition counseling should be a first-line therapy for individuals with mild to moderate acne. It looks like it's the high glycemic foods and dairy products. Uh, so we're talking sugar, soda, uh, refined junky carbs, white flour, breakfast cereal, and um, dairy products like milk, cheese, yogurt, whey, as well as saturated and trans fats concentrated in meat, dairy, junk, and fast food. So, for example, acne patients should be encouraged to discontinue any whey protein supplements they might be taking. Uh, the relationship between milk and acne severity may be explained by the presence in dairy of normal reproductive sex steroid hormones or the enhanced production of growth hormones, such as IGF-1. And if you're like, wait, I, I gave up dairy a month ago and still no change. It should be noted that changes in acne due to any dietary changes are likely to take at least 10 to 12 weeks, so you have to stick to it. Not surprisingly, acne patients are more than twice as likely to have a non-vegan diet compared to controls, but the difference did not reach statistical significance. So maybe the vegans were eating a lot of vegan junk? Uh, but what about this? Vitamin B12-induced acnes. Our fellow great ape herbivores like gorillas get all the B12 they need practicing the eating of feces, but my preference would be to take B12 supplements. And you don't have to worry about getting too much, because there are evidently no reports of adverse effects associated with excess B12 intake, but that's not true. First described back in the 1950s, about 1 in 10 people erupt in acne within days or even just within hours of getting an injection of vitamin B12, which then disappears rapidly when you stop injecting them. At the time, we had no idea what the mechanism might be, a problem still unsolved even uh, up until just a few years ago. But then we finally figured it out. Vitamin B12 modulates the gene expression of the skin bacteria that cause acne. Uh, they swab the skin of 10 people before and after being injected with vitamin B12. Turns out the level of B12 on your skin is proportional to the level in your blood. And so after injection, the bacteria on your skin have to make less of their own B12. And so the acne bacteria could concentrate instead on using its cellular machinery to churn out more compounds to attack your face. Without excess B12 on the skin, shown here in green, the bacteria has to uh, make most on its own at the expense of porphyrins, which can trigger acne inflammation. When there's lots of B12 floating around, the bacteria can not waste resources and focus instead on trying to pimple you up. OK, so wait, uh, what do you do? Uh, those on plant-based diets have to take supplemental B12, yes, but we don't have to get injections. Vitamin B12-related acne tends to occur only in dosages in excess of 5,000 to 10,000 micrograms a week, well in excess of the 50 micrograms a day I recommend, or alternately my 2,000 single weekly dose. I mean, the only time you'd be taking between 5 to 10,000 a week is if you were treating B12 deficiency. If you remember from my previous video, B12 deficiency is treated with 1,000 micrograms a day for a month or more, and that could potentially trigger it, as noted in this uh, vegan woman who wasn't taking B12, developed B12 deficiency, had to be treated with such high doses her face erupted in acne. So all the more reason not to fall B12 deficient in the first place. But look, worse comes to worse. Even if you do get B12 injections, the likelihood of it triggering acne may only be about 1 in 10. In 2019, a study found an association between high intakes of vitamins B6 and B12 from food and supplements 
with the risk of hip fracture among postmenopausal women in the Harvard Nurses Health Study. Uh, but note it was only the combined high intake of vitamins B6 and B12. Uh, we know that treatment with high doses of vitamin B6 may alone increase hip fracture risk. After a decade or so, uh, those who had been taking high-dose B6 supplements had about 40% higher hip fracture risk, but not in those taking B12. And that's what the Harvard study found, too. High intake of vitamin B12 alone was not associated with increased risk. In fact, some observational studies suggest slightly lower fracture risk at high uh, B12 blood levels. But what we care about most are interventional studies where people are randomized to B12 so we can see what happens. And when you do that, no increased fracture risk among those given B12. In conclusion, based on randomized controlled trials, high doses of vitamin B12 have not been shown to be associated with the risk of fractures. OK, but what about this? In 2017, a study found that men taking vitamin B12 supplements appeared to have an increase in lung cancer risk. Now, they didn't find any such association in women. It was mostly among smoking men. I mean, could it be that you know, B12 was like feeding some budding tumors? I mean, it's hard to imagine a, a vitamin being carcinogenic on its own, and especially somehow only in men, not women. The bottom line is that replication of these findings with additional studies is necessary. And indeed, when you put all the observational studies together, there was no significant correlation between the levels of B12 in the blood and lung cancer, whether you smoked or not. I mean, if anything, most studies seem to be trending towards higher B12 levels being protected. But then in 2018, a new study found an association between overall lung cancer risk and higher circulating levels of B12, again appearing to be uh, more of a smoker thing. Now, this was another observational study. Those with higher B12 levels were just observed to have higher cancer levels. And so uh, those of you who've been following my work know the drill. There are two potential issues that arise in observational studies that prevent you from ascribing cause and effect confounding factors also known as lurker variables, and reverse causation. What might be a lurker variable in this case? A third factor associated with both higher B12 levels in cancer, and that may be the true cause? Well, who has higher levels of B12 circulating in their blood? Those who eat lots of meat and dairy. In fact, probably the most important contributors. And those who eat more meat do tend to have more lung cancer, about 35% more risk for every about uh, daily quarter-pound burger, and 20% increased risk for each like you know, breakfast sausage leg. So no wonder those with higher B12 levels in their blood could have more lung cancer. The B12 could just be a marker for meat intake. And if you remember, reverse causation is when instead of X leading to Y, maybe Y is instead leading to X. So instead of high B12 blood levels leading to cancer, I mean, maybe cancer leads to high blood levels. And indeed, nearly three quarters of cancer patients exhibit elevated B12 levels. Uh, so elevated B12 levels may just be a marker for cancer. Um, there's all sorts of things beyond just taking extra B12 that can raise your levels, liver problems, kidney problems, bone marrow problems, and cancer. So high levels may just be a, a marker of a brewing, not yet diagnosed cancer. Yeah, but what about observational studies specifically linking supplement use to lung cancer? Uh, that too could be reverse causation, where being at risk for cancer, in other words, being a smoker, right, makes you more likely to take vitamins to try to decrease your risk. I mean, basically, any behavior tied to smoking uh, could be indirectly tied to lung cancer, but it's the smoking itself, of course. That's the real lung cancer risk. So we're left with this chicken or the egg causality dilemma, uh, which is why ideally we need to randomize controlled trials to see if there's any cause and effect. Uh, this became even more urgent, with genetic evidence suggesting that those just born with higher lifelong levels may be at increased risk. Thankfully, we do have randomized control trials, over a dozen randomized control trials, randomizing thousands of people, up to 2,000 micrograms of B12 every single day for years, and vitamin B supplementation does not have any effect on getting cancer, dying from cancer, or dying overall. And this includes specifically looking at lung cancer. In fact, if anything, vitamin B supplements may actually lower the risk of the most dangerous form of skin cancer. Does the so-called dark side of cannabis include stroke? 
here said to be associated with non-synthetic marijuana, by which I assume they mean uh, marijuana. Uh, there have been case reports of artery damage due to the vasoconstrictor effect of cannabis, something that's been well documented. One study found cannabis users had 100 times greater odds of suffering from something called multifocal intracranial stenosis, where the arteries inside your brain clamp down at multiple points, but that's a rare condition. What about strokes? The lack of high-level evidence regarding the adverse effects of marijuana usage on brain artery health has led to this notion that recreational marijuana may not be a problem, so they decided to put it to the test. You want high-level evidence, they said? Well, how about a study of literally millions of pot smokers? OK, then. And they found that recreational marijuana use did seem to be associated with an increased risk of being hospitalized with an acute ischemic stroke. Uh, but this may just be among those who smoke regularly, at least once a week. The reason we think it's cause and effect is that the majority of recorded strokes were during or shortly after marijuana exposure. And there are even cases in which strokes recurred after marijuana re-exposure. So you know, put all that together, and it makes a convincing case, uh, though you really have to like randomize people to smoke pot or placebo pot to be sure. It's like the heart disease story. A similar temporal relationship has been found between marijuana use and the development of heart attacks and sudden cardiac death, meaning the heart attack seemed to happen while they were using or right afterwards. However, this is complicated by the fact that cannabis is often used in combination with other drugs, such as alcohol or cocaine. So you can't just ask heart attack victims if they were smoking pot at the time and make the connection without asking about other substance use. Within an hour of snorting cocaine, for example, the risk of having a heart attack goes up more than 20-fold. That's about five times more than after smoking pot. The hour after you smoke marijuana, your heart attack risk does appear to nearly quintuple, but only for that hour. Then your risk drops down to normal. Uh, OK, but what does that mean? Even though heart disease is our number one killer, the risk of having a heart attack every hour is only like one in a million in any particular hour. So even if you then light up a joint, that may quintuple your risk, but that would only bump it to like one in 150,000 risk in that hour. Uh, but it's just for that one hour. So even if you smoked every day, your annual risk might just go up a few percent. But why the increased risk at all? Well, we've known since the 70s that within an hour of smoking a joint, pulse rate goes up about 35%. Uh, smoking a single joint increases blood pressure too, as well as carbon monoxide levels in the blood of angina patients, and cuts their ability to exercise nearly in half. Uh, now, was that just because of breathing smoke, any kind of smoke? No. Smoking a placebo joint, a joint with marijuana from which the THC has been removed, only cuts down exercise capacity like 9%, compared to cutting the time they could exercise before the chest pain started by 48% with the cannabis, so it does seem to be a specific drug effect. Uh, now, whether that's as bad as tobacco, we'd never know until a year later. Smoking a marijuana cigarette decreased the exercise time until angina more than smoking a tobacco cigarette, which only cut exercise capacity 23% compared to 50% after the joint. Uh, this may be because marijuana puts more demand on the heart, so no surprise then it was worse than tobacco. It may also be the carbon monoxide. Uh, smoking marijuana leads to nearly five times more carbon monoxide in your bloodstream than smoking tobacco. Uh, this is because pot smokers inhale deeper and then hold the smoke in, allowing more carbon monoxide into your system. So between that and the cardio acceleration, uh, the increased heart rate and pressure, that could account for the accelerated chest pain in heart disease patients. Does it have any chronic effects on our arteries? 
cannabis users do seem to have relatively stiffer arteries for their age, suggesting an acceleration of the aging process, and we are only as old as our arteries. Even secondhand marijuana smoke may be harmful, according to this recent study in the Journal of the American Heart Association entitled One Minute of Marijuana Secondhand Smoke Impairs Vascular Endothelial Function, meaning artery function. And so there was a call to protect vulnerable populations, including the elderly and disabled, and residents of multi-unit housing, pregnant women and children. Even just one minute of exposure to marijuana secondhand smoke in rats. So it's not clear how applicable this is outside of perhaps not smoking around your pets. Alan Goldhammer is the founder of the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, which has fasted 10,000 people for conditions ranging from diabetes and cardiovascular disease to autoimmune diseases. He noted that conditions that seem to be tied to dietary excess tend to respond predictably to the use of fasting followed by a health-promoting diet, which he describes as a low-salt, all-plant, high-fiber, low-fat, low-protein, and low-sugar diet. This approach offers people an option to eliminate the cause of lifestyle diseases, often to the point where the medication is no longer needed, in contrast to conventional medicine, which is more about the suppression of the symptoms associated with the disease rather than removing the underlying root cause. Uh, Goldhammer put it this way, if you treat high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, or autoimmune disease medically, they'll tell you, you know, you'll be on these medications the rest of your life. I mean, that's them, in effect, promising you, if you follow their advice to the letter, you will be sick the rest of your life. Preliminary data suggest fasting may benefit metabolic diseases, pain syndromes, high blood pressure, chronic inflammatory diseases, allergic diseases, and psychosomatic disorders. But the highest level of evidence we have for the benefits of fasting are in regards to rheumatic diseases, autoimmune inflammatory joint diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. Nearly a century ago, it was written that diet treatment is not generally recognized by the medical profession as one of the weapons with which to attack such diseases. This attitude persisted until relatively recently, but a systematic review of controlled trials has since shown a statistically and clinically significant beneficial long-term effect. Rheumatoid arthritis has a well-known genetic component, but the concordance rate, the chance that a pair of identical twins both get it when one has it, is probably under 30%, despite having the same genes, leaving 70% to be explained by non-genetic factors. Even if we don't know exactly what those factors are, fasting has been compared to rebooting the hard drive in a computer. I mean, sometimes a drive gets corrupted, and you don't know exactly what the problem is, but if you just turn it off and reboot it, that corruption may get cleared out. The evidence base started with case reports, fasting followed by a plant-based diet, remarkable reports of years of pain and stiffness gone within a week, and more importantly, stayed gone on the healthier diet. One after another like that, but case reports are just glorified anecdotes. I mean, there have been studies going back decades suggesting fasting may represent the most rapid available way to induce relief of arthritic pain and swelling for patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, but the studies often failed to have control for the placebo effect, which is especially important when it comes to relying on self-reported subjective symptoms, such as you know, pain and general well-being. But there are objective measures, lab tests of inflammation, that don't appear to be affected by placebos, and that's what you can see in control trials, starting immediately and remaining down for at least a year. Ten different measures of inflammation significantly decreased after the fasting and subsequent meat and egg-free diet, whereas none of the parameters budged in those disease victims that continued to eat their regular diets. And the squelching of inflammation translated into a significant reduction in pain, morning stiffness, a loss of grip strength, and number of tender and swollen joints. Even a year after the trial was over, those who benefited from the diet continued to benefit in terms of pain, stiffness, tender and swollen joints, presumably because they stuck with it. Uh, there's little doubt 
that while fasting, both inflammation and pain are relieved. But if you go to the, back to the same diet you were on before, the inflammation returns unless, evidently, the fasting period followed by a vegetarian diet. Why might that be? Well, it could be due to the changes in the microbiome, the improvement in symptoms coincided with a significant alteration of the intestinal flora, which may somehow be beneficial, perhaps by uh, strengthening the gut barrier. Uh, we know fasting can decrease the leakiness of the gut in rheumatoid arthritis patients, uh, but we don't yet know what role, if any, it plays in the disease process. It could be as simple as icosanoid, the mediator of inflammation that are formed from arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a long-chain inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found in animal fats. The biggest contributors are chicken and eggs, which together contribute nearly half of American intake. Uh, that's been suggested as an explanation of why those eating more plant-based appear to have better mental health. They're not suffering the cascade of neuroinflammation caused by arachidonic acid why removing eggs, chicken, and other meat was shown in a randomized control trial to improve mood, suggesting the arachidonic acid might be negatively impacting mood states, and may help explain the impact of more plant-based diets on inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis. So that may help explain why maintaining a plant-based diet appears to be necessary after the fast to prevent the recurrence of symptoms and inflammatory activity or as one popular press article put it, fasting may just be a tool to get you to radically kickstart a change in the way you eat. Okay. The strongest evidence of the benefits of fasting surrounds the treatment of an autoimmune joint disease known as rheumatoid arthritis, as I detailed in my last video. Uh, there was a German study suggesting benefits for osteoarthritis as well, with reported improvements in pain and joint function, but we'd really need randomized controlled trials to know for sure. The researchers despair that they only had 30 patients, but that's 30 times more than many reports on fasting in the medical literature, which may detail only single cases. For example, a woman with a rare autoimmune disease known as mixed connective tissue disease, uh, which can cause all sorts of painful and distressing symptoms treated with steroids in an attempt to suppress their immune system. But 21 days later, off her medications, her symptoms improve with fasting, and more importantly, seem to stay away. So does fasting work for mixed connective tissue disease? Well, all we can say is, hey, at least it worked at least once. A similar success story was reported with fibromyalgia. A woman with pain throughout her body couldn't sustain activity on lots of drugs, but ended up symptom-free 24 days later, and remained that way at least a month later. But when a modified fasting regimen was tried on dozens of individuals, the benefits seen at two weeks largely disappeared by week 12. What about lupus? A 45-year-old woman remaining in pain despite her immunosuppressive drugs, but pain-free by day four of fasting, and remain symptom-free for a year before wiping them out again with a second fast. Now, note this wasn't just fasting, but fasting followed by a plant-based diet in an attempt to solidify the gains. And a strictly plant-based diet, you know, zero animal protein, alone has been shown to control symptoms in at least some cases. The same with sacroiliitis, a common manifestation of ankylosing spondylitis, and an autoimmune arthritis that primarily affects the spine, causing back pain that can last for years. They tried all sorts of conventional therapies and drugs, but the pain still didn't go away. So they tried recommending the complete avoidance of animal foods, and saw distinct persistent improvements within days until he ate meat again, but back on plant-based nutrition, he was off most of his drugs, almost completely free of symptoms. So at least in this case, inflammatory pain refractory to other treatment was abolished by eating healthier. So hey, at least it's worth a try. Autoimmune glomerulonephritis, where your body attacks your own kidneys, is a common manifestation of lupus. In a case series of 29 patients who were fasted for 60 hours and then just put on fruits and vegetables until they got better, described such remarkable recoveries that fasting, in their opinion, should be an essential part of treatment.
What about multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune nerve disease? Sufferers were randomized to a fasting-mimicking diet, meaning a modified fast that started out with an 800-calorie-a-day diet of fruit, rice, or potatoes, and then they spent a week sipping a few hundred calories of flaxseed oil and vegetable broth before transitioning to a plant-based Mediterranean diet, and over the next three months experienced a significant improvement in overall quality of life. They also tried a ketogenic diet, but that failed to offer clinically or statistically significant overall benefit. And finally, chronic urticaria hives, where you get a rash of itchy wheels and welts, started to improve on day three of the fast, and completely disappeared by day 11. This is consistent with studies out of Germany and Japan that evidently showed around a 75% effectiveness for such patients with what looks like some sort of tea with sugar diet. Certainly worth giving fasting therapy a try, but of course fasting should only be done under trained medical supervision. Otherwise, you never know if you have some you know, hidden underlying kidney issue that could land you in a coma, and then in the more. Right? You have to have your kidney function and electrolytes monitored to make sure your body is up for the challenge. Uh, despite the potential benefits, water-only fasting is not a cure or treatment in the traditional sense. It's simply intended to promote the body's self-healing mechanism, since you know, by definition fasting is unsustainable. In order to maintain the results obtained by water-only fasting, it is necessary to adhere to a health-promoting lifestyle that includes a healthy diet of minimally processed plant foods, sleep, and exercise. The largest study in history on the health effects of being overweight analyzing data from more than 50 million people from nearly 200 countries, found that excess body weight accounts for the premature deaths of about 4 million people every year. Uh, most of these deaths are from heart disease, but the researchers found convincing or probable evidence linking obesity to 20 different disorders, a, a veritable uh, alphabet soup of potential health concerns. In the ABCs of health consequences, A is for arthritis. Uh, obesity can make rheumatoid arthritis worse and, and increase the risk of another inflammatory joint disease, the so-called disease of King's gout. The most common joint disease in the world, though, is osteoarthritis, and obesity may be the main modifiable risk factor. Osteoarthritis develops when the cushioning cartilage lining of joints breaks down faster than your body can build it back up. Uh, the knees are the most commonly affected, leading to the assumption that the relation to obesity was simply the you know, excess wear and tear from the added load on the joints. But non-weight-bearing joints like the hands and the wrists can also be affected, suggests the link isn't you know, purely mechanical. Obesity-related dyslipidemia may be playing a role with elevations in the amounts of triglycerides, fat, and cholesterol in the blood aggravating inflammation in the joints, just like cholesterol can aggravate the inflammation in your artery walls. Osteoarthritis sufferers not only have higher cholesterol levels in the blood, they have higher cholesterol levels within their joints, both in aspirated joint fluid and in the cartilage itself. Drip cholesterol on human cartilage in a petri dish, and you can worsen the inflammatory degeneration, helping to explain why the higher people's cholesterol, the worse their disease. Cholesterol-lowering statin drugs may both help prevent and treat osteoarthritis, as can a cholesterol-lowering diet. A healthy enough plant-based diet may offer the best of both worlds, dropping cholesterol as much as a starting dose of a statin drug within a single week, and only has good side effects, such as lowering blood pressure, and facilitating weight loss. Even just losing about a pound a year over the span of a decade may decrease the odds of developing osteoarthritis by more than 50%. Weight reduction may even obviate the need for knee replacement surgery. Obese arthritis sufferers randomized to lose weight improve their knee function as much as those going through surgery within just eight weeks. The researchers concluded that losing 20 pounds of fat might be regarded as an alternative to knee replacement. I mean, isn't it easier to just get your knees replaced than lose 20 pounds? You know, rarely discussed is the fact that nearly 1 in 200 knee replacement patients die within 90 days of surgery. Uh, given the extreme popularity of this operation, about 700,000 a year in the U.S., an orthopedics journal editor suggested that 
people considering this operation are inadequately attuned to the possibility it may kill them. Arguably, the single most salient fact to share with a patient considering the operation. An orthopedic surgeon responded questioning whether patients should be told about the chance the operation may kill them. Quote, to me, the real question is whether this knowledge will help the patient. Will it add to the anxiety of the already anxious patient, perhaps to the point of denying that patient a helpful operation? Or will this knowledge motivate a less handicapped patient to stick to a diet and physical activity regime? Ultimately, then, the question boils down to the surgeon's judgment." Unquote. Even among the vast majority who survive the surgery, approximately one in five knee replacement patients describe being unsatisfied with the outcome. A weight loss with a healthy diet, on the other hand, may offer a non-surgical alternative that instead treats the cause and offers only beneficial side effects. In the ABCs of the health consequences of obesity, if A is for arthritis, as laid out in my last video, then B is for back pain. Being overweight is not just a risk factor for low back pain, but also sciatica, irradiating nerve pain, and lumbar disc degeneration and disc herniation. Like in the arthritis story, this may similarly be due to a combination of the hefty load, uh, high cholesterol, and inflammation associated with being overweight. Why cholesterol? Autopsy studies and angiography studies show that the lumbar arteries that feed the spine can get clogged off with atherosclerosis and starve the discs in your lower back. B is also for blood pressure. Excess visceral fat, excess internal abdominal fat can physically compress your kidneys, and the increased pressure can effectively squeeze sodium back into your bloodstream, increasing your blood pressure. Together, the combination of obesity and hypertension can have disastrous health implications, but the good news is that even just a few pounds of weight loss can help take the pressure off. Losing weight has been described as a vital strategy for controlling hypertension. Losing around 9 pounds may lower blood pressure about as much as cutting salt intake approximately in half. C is for cancer. As many as three-quarters of people surveyed were evidently unaware of the link between obesity and cancer, when in fact, based on a comprehensive review of 1,000 studies, excess body fat raises the risk of most cancers including esophageal cancer, stomach cancer, colorectal cancer, liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer, kidney cancer, brain cancer, thyroid cancer, and bone marrow cancer, uh, multiple myeloma. It could be the chronic inflammation of obesity. It could be the high insulin levels due to insulin resistance. Uh, besides controlling blood sugars, insulin is a potent growth factor that can promote tumor growth. In women, it could also be the excess estrogen. You know, after the ovaries shut down at menopause, fat takes over as the principal site of estrogen production. That's why obese women have up to nearly twice the estrogen level circulating in their bloodstream, which is associated with increased risk of developing and dying from breast cancer. Uh, the data on prostate cancer isn't as strong, uh, though obesity is associated with an increased risk of invasive penis cancer. One of the reasons we're confident the link between obesity and cancer is cause and effect, and not just an indirect consequence of eating poorly, is that when people lose weight, even just through bariatric surgery, their overall risk of cancer goes down. Those experiencing a sustained weight loss, about 40 pounds after surgery, went on to develop around a third fewer cancers over about the subsequent decade than the non-surgical control group of matched individuals that continue to you know, slowly gain weight over time. The exception, though, is colorectal cancer. Colon and rectal cancer appears to be the only malignancy for which the risk goes up after obesity surgery. After bariatric surgery, the rate of rectal cancer death may triple. Uh, the rearrangement of anatomy involved in one of the most common surgeries, a ruin by gastric bypass, is thought to increase bile acid exposure along the intestinal lining. This causes sustained pro-inflammatory changes even years after the procedure, which is thought responsible for the increased cancer risk. 
In contrast, losing weight by dietary means has the potential to decrease obesity-related cancer risk across the board. That's what my book, How Not to Diet, is all about. D is for diabetes. As laid out in a consensus statement from the International Diabetes Federation, obesity is considered the single most important risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes, the leading cause of kidney failure, uh, the leading cause of lower limb amputations, and the leading cause of adult onset blindness. Ironically, many of the leading drugs used to treat diabetes, including insulin itself, actually cause further weight gain, creating a vicious cycle. So again, using lifestyle medicine to instead treat the underlying cause is not only safer, simpler, and cheaper, but also can be most effective. In the ABCs of health consequences of obesity, if A is for arthritis and B is for back pain and blood pressure, C is for cancer and D is for diabetes, then E is for encephalopathy. Encephalopathy means brain disease. There's consistent data linking obesity in middle age to higher risk of dementia later in life. Overweight individuals have about a third higher risk, and those who are obese in midlife seem to uh, have about 90% greater risk of becoming demented. Uh, the risk isn't just limited to future dysfunction, though people with excess body weight don't appear to think as clearly at any age. Obese individuals show broad impairments in what are called executive functions of the brain such as working memory, decision-making, planning, cognitive flexibility, and verbal fluency. These play a, I mean, a critical role in you know, everyday life. Uh, people may think about their obesity and the resulting stigma they experience as much as you know, five times an hour, but the cognitive deficits do not appear to rise just from distraction. I mean, there are structural brain differences between normal weight and overweight individuals. A review entitled Does the Brain Shrink as the Waist Expands noted gray matter atrophy across all ages among those carrying excess body fat. This reduced brain volume has then correlated with the lower executive function. A compromised integrity of the rest of the brain, the white matter, suggests accelerated brain aging, even in young adults and children with obesity. Uh, cognitive deficits in young populations suggest it's something about the obesity itself that's affecting brain function rather than a, a later clinical consequence, such as you know, high blood pressure. Uh, purported mechanisms for this executive dysfunction include obesity-related inflammation and oxidative stress. So does weight loss improve cognitive function? Based on a meta-analysis of 20 studies, mental performance across a, a variety of domains can be significantly improved with even modest weight loss, uh, though no studies have yet been done to determine if this then translates into a normalization of Alzheimer's disease risk. F is for fertility, or rather failed uh, fertility. Overweight couples struggling to have children should be educated on the detrimental effects of fatness. One meta-analysis concluded as weight loss is associated with an improvement in pregnancy rates among infertile women. Men also may suffer impaired fertility. Uh, the heavier a man is, the greater the risk of having a low sperm count or being completely sterile. Uh, this may in part be due uh, to the effects of excess body fat on testosterone levels. Uh, fat isn't just the primary site of estrogen production in postmenopausal women, but in men as well. There's an enzyme in body fat that actually converts testosterone into estrogen. Uh, men even going from obese to just overweight could potentially raise testosterone levels in their blood 13%. A more dramatic cause of infertility in obese men is called hidden penis, also referred to in the medical literature as buried penis, concealed penis, or inconspicuous penis. It occurs when the excess fat in the pubic area subsumes the male member, since the base of the penis is attached internally to the pubic bone. Uh, it's also called trapped penis, because the moist and folding skin surfaces can result in a chronic inflammatory dermatitis leading to scarring, uh, requiring a surgical intervention. So F may also stand for 
free willy. In the ABCs of Health Consequences of Obesity, it looks like we're up to G, and G is for gallstones. Uh, the number one digestive reason people are hospitalized is because of a gallbladder attack. Every year, more than a million Americans are diagnosed with gallstones, and about 700,000 have to get their gallbladder surgically removed. It's a relatively safe procedure. Complication rates tend to be under 5%, and the mortality rate is only about 1 in 1,000. But 1 in 10 may develop a postcholecystectomy syndrome of uh, persistent gastrointestinal symptoms long after their gallbladder is removed. What are gallstones made of? In 80-90% of cases, the gallstones are mostly just crystallized cholesterol, uh, forming like rock candy in your gallbladder when cholesterol gets too concentrated. Um, this was used to explain why some small early studies found non-vegetarians had a higher incidence of gallstones, but the results from more recent larger studies are more equivocal, with one study suggesting protection from gallbladder disease, but another showing higher rates among vegetarians independent of weight. The biggest purported cause and effect risk factor, though, may be obesity, increasing risk as much as sevenfold, with a doubling of risk even at the heavier side of normal. Ironically, rapid weight loss may also be a trigger. A half pound a day has been deemed to be like the upper limit for uh, medically safe weight loss based on gallstone formation. Uh, ultrasound studies found that above that, the chance of new gallstones can go from less than 1 in 200 a week to closer to 1 in 40. Uh, to help prevent a gallstone attack, uh, you can increase your fiber intake. Not only is dietary fiber intake associated with less gallbladder disease in the first place, those placed on high-fiber foods during a weight loss regimen suffered significantly less gallbladder sludging than those losing the same weight without the extra fiber. G is also for GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Fiber-rich food consumption also decreases the risk of acid reflux. Previously, I explored how chronically straining at stool may push part of the stomach up into the chest cavity. Well, the excess abdominal pressure due to obesity may have the same effect, pushing acid up into the throat, causing heartburn and inflammation. The increased pressure on the abdominal organs associated with obesity may also explain why overweight women suffer from more vaginal prolapse, where organs such as the rectum push out into the vaginal cavity. The deadliest letter in the alphabet of obesity consequences, however, is H. H is for heart disease. Of the 4 million deaths attributed to excess body weight every year around the world, nearly 70% of the deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. Is it just because they're eating poorly? Mendelian randomization studies suggest that people randomized from conception to be heavier just based on genetics do indeed have high rates of heart disease and stroke regardless of what they eat. The question is, if you lose weight, does your risk drop? Enter the SOS trial, the first long-term control trial to compare the outcomes of thousands of bariatric surgery patients to match control subjects who started out at the same weight but went the non-surgical route. The control group maintained their weight, whereas the surgical group maintained about a 20% weight loss over the next 10 to 20 years. Over that time, the weight loss group not only developed 80% less diabetes, but suffered significantly fewer heart attacks and strokes so not surprisingly significantly reduced their total mortality overall. Uh, you can see how 10 years out, the weight loss group appeared to cut their risk of fatal heart attacks and strokes in half. In the ABCs of Health Consequences of Obesity, I is for immunity. Uh, the SOS trial, which followed the fates of thousands of bariatric surgery patients for a decade or two, compared to a control group that maintained their weight, and those who surgically lost about 20% of their body weight not only lived longer, thanks in part to less diabetes and less cardiovascular disease, but they also got less cancer. This may be because anti-tumor immunity appears to be affected by weight. Natural killer cells are your immune system's first line of defense against cancer cells, as well as many viral infections and their function 
is severely impaired in obesity. Uh, randomized obese individuals to a weight loss program, though, and there was a significant reactivation of their natural killer cell function within just three months. Uh, the program involved an exercise component, though, and so it's you know, hard to tease out the impact of the weight loss itself, since physical activity alone can boost natural killer cell activity. On the other end of the immune spectrum, obesity is suspected to be a causal risk factor for the development of the autoimmune disease multiple sclerosis. Uh, this suggests obesity is associated with the worst of both worlds when it comes to immune function, underactivity when it comes to protecting against cancer and infection, but overactivity when it comes to certain inflammatory autoimmune conditions. J is for jaundice. Thanks to the obesity epidemic, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is now the most common liver disorder in the industrialized world. Uh, fat doesn't just end up in our belly and thighs, but inside some of our internal organs. More than 80% of individuals with abdominal obesity may have fatty infiltration into their liver, and those with severe obesity, the prevalence can exceed 90%. This can lead to inflammation, scarring, and ultimately cirrhosis and liver cancer. Uh, currently, this non-alcoholic fatty hepatitis is the leading cause of liver transplants in American women, and men are expected to catch up in 2020. K is for kidneys. Obesity is one of the strongest risk factors for chronic kidney disease as well. Uh, your kidneys compensate for the metabolic demands of the excess weight by redlining to what's called hyperfiltration to deal with the extra workload. Uh, this resulting increased pressure within the kidneys can damage the sensitive structures and increase the risk of kidney failure over the long term. What about LMNOP through Z? If you want to continue through the alphabet, well, L could be you know, diminished lung function, M for metabolic syndrome, and so on. Uh, there's even an X for xiphodynia, pain at the tip of the bottom of the breastbone from being kind of bent forward by an expanding abdomen. Given the myriad health conditions associated with excess weight, annual medical spending attributable to obesity is nearly $2,000 per year, with obese workers with multiple conditions costing companies up to $10,000 more in health care coverage compared to lean counterparts. Uh, this may actually account for some of the wage gap that obese employees experience as companies try to you know, pass along these costs beyond just brazen discrimination. Between health care costs and diminished productivity in terms of uh, lost work days, the total lifetime cost of obesity for children and teens has been estimated to exceed $150,000. Some estimates peg the national cost of obesity at about $150 billion, with another $50 billion per year added by 2030 as our increasingly heavy baby boomers continue to age. Others diametrically disagree based on the morbid fact that obese individuals may not live as long, just as the medical costs of tobacco-related diseases may be more than offset by the shortened survival of smokers, the lifetime health care costs of obese individuals may turn out to be lower because they're expected to die so much sooner. So the uh, true cost may be more in lives rather than dollars. How much does being overweight cut your life short? I'll explore just that question next. Martin Luther King Jr. warned that human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable, and the same may be true of the human lifespan. In the 1800s, life expectancy was less than 40, but it's been steadily increasing over the last two centuries, gaining about eh, two years per decade. That is, until recently. Longevity gains have faltered or even reversed. Thanks to the obesity epidemic, we may now be raising the first American generation to live shorter lives than their parents. The downward trend in longevity is expected to accelerate as the current younger generation, who started out heavier and earlier than ever before, uh, ages into adulthood. If the obesity epidemic continues unchecked, current trends signal a potential looming social and economic catastrophe. In the coming decades, some predict we may lose uh, two to five or more years of life expectancy in the United States. I mean, to put that into perspective, a miracle cure for all forms of cancer 
would only add 3.5 years to the average American lifespan. In other words, reversing the obesity epidemic might save more lives than curing cancer. The evidence of being overweight increases your risk for debilitating diseases like diabetes is considered indisputable. But surprisingly, there's controversy surrounding body weight and overall mortality. In 2013, a CDC scientist published a meta-analysis in the Journal of the American Medical Association suggesting being overweight was actually advantageous. Uh, yes, grade 2 or 3 obesity, like being average height, 5 foot 6, and weighing about 215 plus pounds, was associated with living a shorter life. But grade 1 obesity, uh, between about 185 to 215 pounds at that height, was not. And just being overweight, 155 to 185 pounds, appeared to be protective compared to those who were normal weight, 115 to 155. The overweight individuals, uh, BMI 25 to 30, appeared to live the longest. Headline writers were giddy. Right? Being overweight can extend your life. Dreading your diet? Don't worry, plump people live longer. Extra pounds might mean lower chance of death. Not surprisingly, this study ignited a firestorm of controversy in the public health community. The study was called ludicrous, flawed, misleading. The chair of nutrition at Harvard lost his cool, calling the study really a pile of rubbish. Uh, fearing the food industry might exploit this study in the same way the petroleum industry misuses controversy over climate change. Public health advocates can't just dismiss data they find inconvenient, though. I mean, science is science. But how could being overweight increase the risk of life-threatening diseases, yet at the same time make you live longer? Uh, this became known as the obesity paradox. The solution to the puzzle appears to lie with two major sources of bias. The first being confounding by smoking. Right? The nicotine in tobacco can lead to weight loss, so if you're skinnier because you smoke, well, then no wonder you'd live a shorter life with a slimmer waist. Right? The failure to control for the effect of smoking in studies purporting to show an obesity paradox uh, leads to the dangers of obesity being grossly underestimated. The second major source of bias is reverse causality. Instead of lower weight leading to life-threatening diseases, is it more likely that life-threatening diseases are leading to lower weight? I mean, conditions such as hidden tumors, chronic heart and lung disease, alcoholism, and depression can all cause unintentional weight loss months or even years before they're even diagnosed. I mean, it's normal to be overweight in this country, right? So people who are, who are abnormally thin, in other words, ideal weight, I mean, could actually be taking care of themselves, right? But maybe heavy smokers, elderly and frail, or seriously ill with weight loss from their disease. To put the obesity paradox issue to the test once and for all, the Global BMI Mortality Collaboration was formed, reviewing data for more than 10 million people from hundreds of studies in dozens of countries, the largest evaluation of BMI and mortality in history. To help eliminate bias, they omitted smokers and those with known chronic disease, and then excluded the first five years of follow-up to try to remove from the analysis those with undiagnosed conditions who lost weight due to an impending death. And the results were clear. Being overweight and all grades of obesity were associated with a significantly greater risk of dying prematurely. Uh, so adjusting for these biases leads to eliminating the obesity paradox altogether. In other words, the so-called obesity paradox appears to be just a myth. Indeed, when intentional weight loss is actually put to the test, people live longer. There are bariatric surgery studies, like the SOS trial, that show weight loss reduces long-term mortality, and, and randomizing people to weight loss through lifestyle changes shows the same thing. Uh, losing a dozen pounds through diet and exercise was found to be associated with a 15% drop in overall mortality. Now, I mean, exercise alone may extend the lifespan even without weight loss, uh, but there also appears to be a similar longevity benefit of weight loss through dietary means alone. We seem to have become inured to the mortal threat of obesity. If you go back in the medical literature a half century or so, when obesity wasn't just run of the mill, the descriptions are much more grim. Obesity is always tragic, and its hazards are terrifying. 
but it's not just obesity. Of the 4 million deaths every year attributed to excess body fat, nearly 40% of the victims are just overweight, not obese. According to two famous Harvard studies, weight gain of as little as 11 pounds from early adulthood through middle age increases risk of major chronic diseases such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. The flip side, though, is that even modest weight loss can have major health benefits. What's the optimal BMI? Uh, the largest studies in the United States and around the world found that having a normal body mass index, a BMI from 20 to 25, is associated with the longest lifespan. Put all the best available studies with the longest follow-up together, and that can be narrowed down even further to a BMI of 20 to 22. That would be about between 124 to 136 pounds for someone who stands 5 foot 6. Um, you can pause the video here to use this unisex chart to see what your optimal weight might be based on your height. But even with a normal BMI, the risk of developing chronic diseases, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and several types of cancer, starts to rise towards the upper end, even starting as low as a BMI of 21. A BMI of 18.5 and 24.5 are both considered within the normal range, but a BMI of 24.5 may be associated with twice the heart disease risk compared to 18.5. Uh, look at this diabetes graph among women. A five-fold difference in diabetes rates all within the so-called ideal range under 25. Just as there are gradations of risk within a normal BMI range, there is a spectrum within obesity. Class 3 obesity, a BMI over 40, can be associated with a loss of a decade of life or more. At a BMI greater than 45, such as a 5 foot 6 person at 280 pounds, life expectancy may shrink to that of a cigarette smoker. Uh, there are, however, so-called obesity skeptics that argue that the health consequences of obesity are unclear or even greatly exaggerated. They are a motley bunch, ranging from feminists, queer theorists, and new ageists to far-right-wing pro-gun, pro-America websites, where the idea is that obesity alarmists are nanny state communists who simply want to stop us from having fun. Unlike activists who, for example, organize to raise consciousness and stamp out the AIDS epidemic, the size acceptance movement appears to have the opposite goal, rallying for less public awareness and treatment of the problem. They do have good slogans, though. We're here, we're spheres, get used to it. I'm all for fighting size, stigma, and discrimination. I have a whole section on weight stigma in my new book. But the adverse health consequences of obesity are an established scientific fact. Can't you be fat but fit? In a study of more than 600 centenarians, those living over 100, only about 1% of the women and not a single one of the men were obese. But there does appear to be a rare subgroup of obese individuals who don't suffer the typical metabolic costs, such as high blood pressure and cholesterol. This raised the possibility that there may be such a thing as benign obesity or healthy obesity. It may just be a matter of time, though, before the risk factors develop. And even if they don't follow long enough, even quote-unquote metabolically healthy obese individuals are at increased risk of diabetes and fatty liver disease and cardiovascular events such as heart attacks and or premature death. Bottom line, there is strong evidence that so-called healthy obesity is a myth. Many fat activists try to downplay the risk of obesity, even as they may be among the epidemic's greatest victims. You know, Lynn McAfee is the director of medical advocacy for the Council on Size and Weight Discrimination, and routinely takes part in obesity conferences and government panels on obesity. I'm not actually particularly that interested in health, she's quoted as saying, and God, I hate science. There was a book originally published in the 80s and then repeatedly republished entitled Dieting Makes You Fat. Since most people who lose weight go on to regain it, the concern is that there may be adverse health consequences of so-called yo-yo dieting. This idea emerged from animal studies that showed, for example, detrimental effects of starving and refeeding obese rats. This captured the media's attention, 
leading to a pervasive common belief about the dangers of weight cycling, uh, discouraging people from even trying. Even the animal data is inconclusive, though. For example, weight cycling mice makes them live longer. Most importantly, though, a review of the human data concluded that evidence for an adverse effect of weight cycling appears sparse if it exists at all. Bottom line, yo-yo dieting is better than none. Ideally, we'd get down to a BMI of 20 to 22, but body mass index doesn't take the composition of the weight into account. For example, bodybuilders are heavy for their height, but can be extremely lean. The gold standard measure of obesity is percentage body fat, but an accurate calculation can be complicated and expensive. All you need to measure BMI is height and weight, but it may underestimate the true prevalence of obesity. The World Health Organization defines obesity as a body fat percentage over 25% in men, or 35% in women. At a BMI of 25, which is considered just barely overweight, body fat percentages in a representative U.S. sample of adults varied between 14% and 35% in men and 26 and 43% in women. So you could be normal weight, but actually obese. Uh, using the BMI cutoff for obesity, only about you know, one in five Americans were obese back in the 90s. But based on their body fat, the true proportion, even back then, was closer to 50%. Half of Americans, not just overweight, but obese. So just using BMI, doctors may misclassify more than half of obese individuals as being eh, just overweight or even normal weight and miss an opportunity to intervene. Uh, the important thing is not the label, though, but the health consequences. Ironically, BMI appears to be an even better predictor of cardiovascular disease death than percentage body fat. I mean, that suggests that excess weight from any source, fat or lean, may not be healthy in the long run. The lifespan of bodybuilders does seem to be cut short. They have about a third higher mortality rate than the general population. The average age of death was around 48 years old. But this may well be due in part to the toxic effects of anabolic steroids on the heart. Preeminent nutritional physiologist Ansel Keys, after which K-rations were named, suggested the mirror method. If you really want to know whether you are obese, just undress and look yourself in the mirror. Don't worry about our fancy laboratory measurements. You'll know. All fat is not the same, though. There's the pinchable superficial flab that you may see you know, jiggling about your body, but then there's the riskier, deeper visceral fat, which coils around and infiltrates your internal organs. Uh, measuring BMI is simple, cheap, and effective, but does not take into account the distribution of fat on the body, whereas waist circumference can provide a measure of the deep underlying belly fat. Both BMI and waist circumference can be used to predict the risk of death due to excess body fat, but even at the same BMI, there appears to be nearly a straight-line increase in mortality risk with widening waistlines. I mean, someone with normal weight central obesity, meaning someone not even overweight according to BMI, but fat around the middle, may have up to twice the risk of dying compared to even someone who's obese according to their height and weight. This is why the current recommendations recommend measuring both BMI and waist circumference. This may be especially important for older women, who lose approximately 13 pounds of bone and muscle as they age from 25 to 65, while quadrupling their visceral fat stores. Men tend to only double. Uh, so even if a woman doesn't gain any weight based on the bathroom scale, she may be gaining fat. What's the waistline cutoff? Increased risk of metabolic complications start at an abdominal circumference of 31.5 inches in women and 37 inches in most men, though closer to 35.5 inches for South Asian, Chinese, and Japanese men. Uh, the benchmark for substantially increased risk starts at about 34.5 inches for women and 40 inches for men. Uh, once you get over an abdominal circumference of about 43 inches in men, mortality rates shoot up about 50% compared to men with 8-inch smaller stomachs, and women suffer 80% greater mortality risk at 37.5 inches compared to 27.5 inches. The reading of a measuring tape may translate into years off one's lifespan. The good news is, 
the riskiest fat is the easiest to lose. Your body appears smart enough to preferentially shed the villainous visceral fat first. Although it may take you know, losing as much as 20% of your weight to realize significant improvements in you know, quality of life for most individuals with severe obesity, your disease risk drops almost immediately. At 3% weight loss, just like 6 pounds for someone weighing 200 pounds, your blood sugar control and triglycerides start to get better. At 5%, your blood pressure and cholesterol improve. Just a 5% weight loss, about 10 pounds for someone starting at 200, may cut your risk of developing diabetes in half. Previously, I showed how exposure to nature can have self-reported psychological benefits, but there was a dearth of data on changes in objective measurements. So I was excited to see this paper on the effects on levels of the stress hormone cortisol in the saliva of those partaking in forest bathing, which just means visiting a forest and surrounding yourself by trees. The level of cortisol in your saliva is considered an indicator of your stress level, and after walking in a forest compared to walking in a city, or even just after hanging out in a forest compared to a city, people's salivary cortisol levels were significantly lower. But wait a second, the same effect was found before they went to the forest. huh? Forest bathing was associated with significantly lower salivary cortisol both before and after compared with visiting an urban area. Now, therefore, it appears that just the thought of going to spend the day in a forest relieved stress. So when comparing the effects of forest bathing versus urban visiting, the anticipation placebo effect may play a more important role in influencing stress levels than the actual experience of being in a forest. So I was ready to dismiss it as just another nebulous psychological effect until I read this. Studies on the effects of forest bathing on the immune function showed that visiting a forest can induce a significant increase in the number and activity of natural killer cells, one of the ways our body fights off cancer. That got my attention. It all started with this study. Twelve men were taken on a long weekend to walk in some forests, and almost all the subjects, 11 out of 12, showed higher natural killer cell activity after the trip. And not just a little, about a 50% increase compared to before the trip. Now, just exercise can affect immune function, but they, they weren't walking any extra. They were just walking in a forest instead. Yeah, but they also were taken on a trip somewhere, introducing other variables. So, I mean, how about randomizing them to go on some city trip versus the forest trip? And if there is some special forest effect, how long does the effect last? Do you have to like walk in a forest every day? Before jumping into all that, how about we first see if it works in women, too? Same kind of setup and same results. A significant boost in natural killer cell activity walking around in the woods, and this time they went back a week later to retest them, and they were still up. Uh, though after a month they came back down. But hey, I mean, once a week should do it. But it was a multiple day trip. I mean, who has time to hang out in forests all weekend, every weekend? How about just a little day trip? The title gives it all away. Boom, same thing, right? A same big jump measured the day after the trip compared to before, and with the same staying power, natural killer cell activity still boosted a week later. This suggests that if people visit a suburban forest park once a week on a day trip, they may be able to maintain the increased anti-cancer immunity. OK, but I'm still not convinced. I mean, how can you attribute the benefit to the forest itself when all you have is before and after data. To make the case that nature had anything to do with it, you'd need a control group that you know, took the same kind of trip but went to somewhere else instead. And here we go. It turns out visiting a forest but not a city increases human natural killer activity. Here's the forest data, just like before, but nothing on a trip to go you know, walking in a city. By the end of the forest trip, 80% of the subjects experienced a boost compared to only 1 in 10 of the city walkers. And both trips were matched for physical activity and alcohol and sleep, other things that can affect immune function. And so here we go, confirmation of boosted immunity, but only on the forest trip, indicating that forest bathing does indeed enhance natural killer cell activity. Moreover, they found that the increased activity lasted up to 30 days after the trip. Check it out. 
right, still up a week later, and even a bit up a month later. Right? This suggests that if people you know, visit a forest once a month, they may be able to maintain increased natural killer cell activity. OK, so now that we know that it's a real effect, the next question is, I mean, why? I mean, what is it about forests that gives us the boost? And I mean, you can imagine a big pharma thinking, right? Can you make it into a pill? We'll find out next. Studies on the effects of forest bathing, a traditional practice in Japan of visiting a forest and breathing its air, have found it can induce significant increases in the number and activity of natural killer cells that can last for as long as a month. And because natural killer cells are one of the ways your body fights cancer by killing off tumor cells, the findings suggest that forest visits may have a preventive effect on cancer generation and progression. OK, but how? I mean, why did the forest environment increase natural killer cell activity? What is it about the forest environment? One thought is that the boost may be related to a reduction in stress. I mean, if you measure the amount of adrenaline flowing through people's systems, I mean, did hanging out in a forest but not a city drop adrenaline levels down? Yes. So, I mean, that checks out, but drip some adrenaline on human blood cells in a petri dish, and there does not appear to be any effect. I mean, the stress hormone cortisol, on the other hand, dramatically suppresses natural killer cell activity. So, you know, maybe the forest led to less stress less cortisol, which release the natural killer cells under its thumb, and you get a, that big boost? Well, uh, we know being surrounded by nature can decrease levels of cortisol in our saliva, but what about our bloodstream? A significant drop after a single day trip to the forest. You know, but a week later, the cortisol was normalizing, and the forest effects sometimes appeared to last an entire month. I mean, anything else that could cause a longer-term immune system change? Maybe we've been missing some of our old friends. Right? If you sample outdoor air, you can pick up an abundance of microorganisms floating around from the soil or water, which are absent in indoor air, which is dominated by you know, organisms that either live on us or are trying to attack us. So maybe on a day-to-day -day basis, in terms of you know, keeping our immune system on ready alert, it might not be sufficient to encounter only the kind of biased microbes of the modern synthetic indoor environment that lacks some of the old friends and probably bears little resemblance to the microbes we you know, evolved to live with over millions of years. Or maybe it's the plants themselves. Maybe it's the aroma of the forest. Trees produce aromatic volatile compounds called phytoncides, like pinene, which you can breathe into your lungs in the forest. But do these compounds actually get into your bloodstream? One hour in the woods, and you get like a six-fold increase in circulating pinene levels circulating throughout your system. OK, but to fully connect all the dots, the phytoncides, like pinene, I mean, these tree essential oils would have to then induce human natural killer cell activity. And guess what? Phytoncides induce human natural killer cell activity. If you stick natural killer cells in a petri dish with some unsuspecting leukemia cells, your killers can wipe out some of the cancer cells, but add a whiff of cypress, white cedar, eucalyptus, or pine, and the cancer cells don't stand a chance. A combination of wood aromas improve the recovery of mice put through the ringer, but this is the study I was looking for. If we want to know if the magic ingredient is the fragrance of the forest, then let's see if we can get that same boost in natural killer cell activity just vaporizing some essential oil from one of the trees into a hotel room overnight. And it worked! A significant boost in natural killer cell activity, uh, though it just boosted their activity rather than their number. And being in the actual forest can do both, so maybe it's a combination of the tree fragrance and the lower cortisol levels working together. Ironically, these phytoncide compounds are part of the tree's own immune system, which we may be able to kind of commandeer. The researchers speculate these compounds may be playing some role in the fact that more heavily forested regions in Japan appear to have lower death rates from breast cancer and prostate cancer. And being out in nature has been found to be an important coping strategy among cancer patients. Uh, it turns out this could potentially be helping more than just with the coping, thanks to the fragrance of trees. Sorghum is the forgotten grain. 
the United States is actually the number one producer of sorghum, but it's typically not used to produce food for American consumers. Instead, it's produced mainly for feeding livestock, or as pet food, or even building materials. But it's actually eaten as a staple in other parts of the world, such as Asia and Africa, uh, where it's been eaten for thousands of years, making it currently the fifth most popular grain grown after wheat, corn, rice, and barley, beating out oats and rye. Because sorghum is gluten-free, because it can be definitively considered safe for people with celiac disease, uh, we're starting to see it emerge as actual human food in the U.S., so I decided to look into just how healthy it might be. Uh, Protein-wise, it's comparable to other grains, but since when do we have to worry about getting enough protein? Fiber is what Americans are desperately deficient in, and sorghum uh, does pull towards the front of the pack. The micronutrient composition is relatively unremarkable. Here's how it rates on minerals, for example. Where sorghum shines is on polyphenol content. Uh, polyphenols are plant compounds associated with reduced risk of a number of chronic diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular diseases, neurodegenerative disorders, and even all-cause mortality. And if you compare different grains, sorghum really does pull ahead, helping to explain why it's antioxidant power is so much higher. Now, uh, sorghum gets its grainy little butt kicked when it comes to fruits and vegetables, but in terms of compared to other grains, a sorghum-based breakfast cereal, for example, might have like eight times the antioxidants than a whole wheat-based cereal. But I mean, what we care about is not antioxidant activity in a test tube, but antioxidant activity within our body. If you measure the antioxidant capacity of your blood after eating regular pasta, it goes up a little. If you replace 30% of the wheat flour with sorghum flour, it doesn't go up much more. But if you eat 30% red sorghum flour pasta, the antioxidant capacity in your bloodstream shoots up like 15-fold. See, there are multiple types of sorghum. There's black sorghum, white sorghum, and red sorghum. Uh, this is how they look in grain form. There's evidently a yellow sorghum too. And red sorghum, and especially black, have like you know, legit you know, fruit and vegetable level antioxidant activity. The problem is I can't find any of the colored ones. I mean, I can go online and buy you know, red or black rice, uh, purple, blue, or red popping corn, and you know, purple or black barley, but I, I can't find red or black sorghum. Hopefully someday, uh, but, uh, but you can find white sorghum for about mm, four bucks a pound. I mean, does it have any unique health-promoting attributes? Uh, it's promoted as an underutilized cereal whole grain with the potential to assist in the prevention of chronic disease, uh, but what is the effect of sorghum consumption on health outcomes? In epidemiological study in China found lower esophageal cancer mortality rates in areas that ate more millet and sorghum compared to you know, corn and wheat, uh, but that may have been more due to avoiding a contaminating fungus than from the benefit in the sorghum itself, I mean, though it's possible. I mean, just as oats are the only source of you know, avananthamides, uh, which give oats some unique health benefits, sorghum, even white sorghum, contain unique pigments known as uh, 3-deoxyanthocyanins, which are strong inducers of some of the detoxifying enzymes in our liver and can inhibit the growth of human cancer cells growing in a petri dish, compared to you know, red cabbage, which has just regular anthocyanin pigments. Uh, but note that white sorghum didn't do much worse than red or black, which have way more of the unique 3-deoxyanthocyanin, so maybe it's just a general sorghum effect. I mean, you don't know until you put it to the test. Sorghum was found to suppress tumor growth and metastasis in human breast cancer xenografts. What does that mean? The research conclude that sorghum could be used as an inexpensive natural cancer therapy without any side effects, strongly recommending the use of sorghum as an edible therapeutic agent possessing tumor suppression and anti-metastatic effects on human breast cancer, but xenograft means human breast cancer implanted in a mouse. Yes, the human tumors grew slower in the mice-fed sorghum extracts and blocked metastasis to the lung, and did the same for human colon cancer that, again, was in mice, which can't necessarily be translated to how human cancers would grow in humans, since, for example, not only do these mice not have a human immune system, they hardly have any immune system. I mean, they're bred 
without a thymus gland, which is where cancer-fighting immunity largely originates. I mean, how else could you keep the mouse's immune system from rejecting the human tissue outright? Right? But this immunosuppression makes these kind of mouse models that much more artificial and that much more difficult to extrapolate to humans. And that's a lot of what we see in the sorghum literature, in vitro data, like in test tubes and petri dishes, and rats and mice. Uh, there had just been this critical missing piece of the puzzle needed to link laboratory data to actual benefits in humans missing. That is, until now. Thankfully, we now have human interventional studies, which we'll explore next. Despite playing a significant role in Africa and Asia as a staple grain, sorghum has only recently emerged as a potential food source in the U.S. It's not just a principal grain in many parts of the world, but evidently used in folk medicine traditions. What might its health benefits be? Uh, there's been some in vitro data from test tubes and petri dishes, and in vivo data, meaning within the living and laboratory animals, but only recently have we started seeing human trials. In one study, subjects were asked to eat sorghum pancakes versus corn pancakes for supper for three weeks, and both groups saw huge 20 to 30 percent drops in their cholesterol, but they were also all told to not eat eggs and other cholesterol-boosting foods, so that may very well have been playing a role. Another study tried biscuits. Those eating sorghum biscuits said they felt more satiated than eating wheat biscuits, but this didn't translate to differences in intake at the subsequent all-you-can-eat meal. So, I mean, who cares what they subjectively felt if it didn't cause them to eat any less? It's no wonder, then, when you put it to the test, those eating sorghum versus wheat biscuits didn't lose any weight. Though the data is a bit mixed, a recent study concluded that sorghum can be an important strategy for weight loss in humans, though the sorghum group didn't actually lose more weight, but they appear to be eating hundreds more calories a day, yet lost more body fat, perhaps because of their greater fiber consumption or other goodies like resistant starch in the sorghum. Uh, the vehicle they used, though, an artificially flavored, colored, and sweetened mixture of water, powdered milk, and either sorghum or wheat, uh, may be good research-wise so you can make a blinded control, but it leaves you wondering what would happen if you actually ate the whole food. Uh, the resistant starch is exciting, though. I mean, most of the starch in sorghum is either slow starch or fully resistant to digestion in the small intestine, which offers a banquet bounty of prebiotics for your good gut flora down in your colon. It's not evidently the sorghum starch itself, but interactions with the proteins and other compounds that effectively act as starch blockers, inhibiting your starch-munching enzymes. Sorghum, then, ends up with the lowest starch digestibility among grains, which is why traditionally it was considered an inferior grain, but inferior in the sense of not providing as many calories. But not providing as many calories is a good thing in the age of epidemic obesity. Give someone a whole wheat muffin compared to a sorghum muffin containing the same amount of starch and see significantly higher blood sugars 45 minutes to two hours later, and a higher insulin spike starting almost immediately. Overall, a 25% lower blood sugar response, and the body only had to release a, a fraction of insulin to deal with it, uh, less than half. Same thing with diabetics. Lower blood sugar spike with a sorghum porridge compared to grits that the body can deal with with a fraction of the insulin. Uh, so we need to educate people how healthy sorghum is and develop convenient, tasty products no, it's already convenient and tasty just the way it is. I mean, one button press on my electric pressure cooker with you know, two parts water, one part sorghum, and it's you know done in 20 minutes. I mean, you can make one big batch and use it all week, just like you would rice, right? But where's the money in people eating the intact whole grain? Instead, the industry is looking at sorghum for its enormous potential for exploitation into so-called functional foods and food additives. Or, I mean, uh, did you know adding sorghum to pork or turkey patties can decrease their cardboardy flavor? And hey, why just eat it when you can instead use it to make gluten-free beer? You know, it's funny in uh, How Not to Diet, when I was talking about taxpayer subsidies to the sugar, corn syrup, oil, and livestock industry, subsidizing cheap animal feed to help make you know, dollar menu meat, I jokingly asked, you know, 
when's the last time you sat down to some sorghum? But hey, now that I know how good it is for you, maybe we should be taking advantage of the quarter billion we're spending to prop up the industry and sit down to some sorghum after all. There is increasing consensus that transitioning towards reduced meat consumption and more plant-based diets is a key feature to address important health and sustainability challenges facing humanity, yet this has been the trajectory of global meat consumption. According to the United Nations, we would have to double the production of meat and dairy to meet the predicted demand for animal proteins in 2050, when in fact we'd have to do the exact opposite if we were to contain the ecological damage. Nearly every credible forecast shows that if we were to have any chance of meeting future food in a sustainable fashion, lowering our meat consumption will be absolutely essential. While more centralized governments may be effective in influencing consumption patterns, uh, since the main drivers of global meat consumption are things like rising incomes, urbanization, and Western culture, I mean, the main identified drivers of meat demand are difficult to influence through direct policy intervention. Thus, we have to take our case directly to the consumer. But you know, information and education may not be enough. Uh, we may need the increased availability of ready-made plant-based products. Too often, ethics and sustainability alone does not stand much of a chance in a world of consumers. Many consumers seem deaf to ethical arguments, which may be quickly forgotten when it comes down to buying food. When it comes to consumer-perceived barriers to following a plant-based diet, the largest barrier may simply be meat appreciation. People enjoy the taste of meat. So in practice, if we want people to shift over to plant-based options, the taste, structure, and nutritional value of vegetarian meals could be developed to more closely follow the preferences of meat eaters. I mean, no point in designing a veggie burger for vegetarians, right? They're already not eating meat, right? So when you know, Pat Brown founded Impossible Foods, his goal was to create something a burger lover would say is better than any burger they've ever had, or the Beyond Burger created by Beyond Meat, a company founded to tackle climate change by creating plant-based products that were juicy, meaty, and delicious. But how much better are they for the climate? Both the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger have had environmental life cycle assessments published by reputable groups. I did a little piece for the Swiss investment firm UBS summarizing the results, and indeed, switching to either drops greenhouse gas emissions, land use, and water footprints down about 90%. Uh, similar analyses have been done on more than 50 different plant-based meats. All such studies found them to be vastly more sustainable, with no real differences in greenhouse gas emissions uh, observed between the kind of different sources of protein they use, whether it's wheat or soy or whatever, though obviously any products containing egg binders would be significantly worse. Now, of course, if you went straight to the unprocessed peas and soybeans from which the Beyond and Impossible burgers are made, you could not just get a 90% lower impact, but like a 99% lower impact, but that impact drops to zero if no one is willing to eat it. A review on consumer research of meat substitutes found that although things like health and environment can persuade consumers to try a meat substitute, it's the appearance and taste that are crucial factors for their consumption on a regular basis. Interestingly these days, though, plant-based foods may actually have a leg up uh, if you give college students actual animal-based chocolate milk, mac and cheese, chicken tenders, and meatballs, but lie to them and tell them they're actually made from plants Surprisingly and unexpectedly, the researchers found that when subjects tasted the food and rated how much they liked the taste, those who were told the food was vegan liked the food significantly better than those who were told the truth. I mean, just thinking a food was vegan actually increased liking for the taste of the food. Well, other demographics may have a different reaction, though, in which case there's always sustainability by stealth, using blended products that substitute out some of the animal protein for plant protein. In the last year, such hybrid products have made a promising entrance, so much so that major meat producers, Purdue, Tyson, are bragging about the incorporation of plant protein into their blended products.
Global meat production has skyrocketed over the last half century, uh, with pork and poultry meat now exceeding 100 megatons a year, 100 million tons, and this growing demand is unsustainable. The reduction of animal products is arguably one of the most impactful ways in which individual consumers can alter their diets to possibly impact individual and societal well-being. And there's a definitely growing interest in plant-based diets and meat reduction, but even just something like meatless Mondays requires dietary change, and sadly, neither sustainability or health approaches are likely to work with those who love their meat. But swapping in plant-based meat substitutes may help help kind of disrupt the negativity about reducing meat, but for hardcore meat eaters, it's got to taste like it and look like it. It's interesting, the more people consume meat substitutes, the less likely they are to care that it has a similar taste, texture, appearance, or smell of meat. But to appeal to those who really need them, right, the meatier, the better. Uh, this has certainly been accomplished with the spate of new products on the market, with all studies agreeing that they're healthier for the planet, but what about healthier for us? Comparing labels of the burgers and looking at four of the worst components of the food supply, trans fats, saturated fats, sodium, and cholesterol, the plant-based burgers win hands down when it comes to trans fat and cholesterol. Uh, we all know trans fats is a serious potential risk factor for cardiovascular disease, cancer, and diabetes, but it's also been recently associated with symptoms of depression, lower testosterone in men, even just at like 1% of calories, and dementia. Higher levels of trans fats in the blood is associated with up to 50% higher risk of developing dementia, including Alzheimer's. Uh, now that partially hydrogenated oils have been phased out of the food supply, the only major source of trans fats left will be from animal products. What's the tolerable upper daily intake level for trans fats? An upper limit was not set for trans fat by the Institute of Medicine because any incremental increase in trans fat intake increases the risk of heart disease, the number one killer of men and women, as in any intake above zero. Uh, because trans fatty acids are unavoidable in diets that contain meat or dairy, consuming zero trans fat would require significant changes in patterns of dietary intake. Uh, one of the authors of the report from Harvard's Nutrition Department offered a memorable explanation for why the Institute of Medicine panel didn't you know, cap it at zero. We can't tell people to stop eating all meat and all dairy products. He said, well, we could tell people to become vegetarians, he added. If we were truly basing this only on science, we would, but it is a bit extreme. Wouldn't want scientists to base anything on science now, would we? No. But anyways, that's a big advantage. And of course, no hormones, no antibiotics, hasn't been you know, designated as probably cancer-causing by the World Health Organization, and on and on. Now, I'm not happy with the added salt, which is about a quarter of the American Heart Association's 1,500 milligram daily upper sodium limit, or the saturated fat, uh, thanks to added coconut oil, um, but uh, these do seem to be outliers. I mean, in the largest study of the nutritional value of plant-based meats to date, saturated fat levels of similar products only average about 2 grams per serving, much better than the animal-based equivalents. Right? Sodium remains a problem throughout the sector, though, like nearly any other processed food out there. How processed are these products? Well, I mean, if you look at the fiber content, for example, yes, I mean, to see any fiber in a burger, that's a good thing, but I mean, compare that to a whole food, right? If you ate the same amount of protein from yellow peas, for example, the primary plant protein in Beyond Burgers, uh, there'd be almost no saturated fat in sodium and a whopping 20 grams of fiber. So yes, you know, processing plants in a processing plant can eliminate 90% of the fiber, but processing plants through animals eliminates 100% of the fiber. Um, so, of course, as the chair of Harvard's nutrition department put it, you know, nutrition policies and dietary guidelines should continue to emphasize a diet rich in whole plant foods, such as nuts, seeds, and legumes, or pulses, which are rich in protein and many other nutrients, uh, but require little industrial processing. But we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Not everyone can go all you know, kale and quinoa overnight. The choice on the Burger King menu isn't between this and this.
right? But between this and this, and in that case, it's a no-brainer. So, are these plant-based burgers healthy or not? Right? And the answer is, compared to what? I mean, eating is kind of a zero-sum game, right? Every food has an opportunity cost. I mean, every time we put something in our mouth, right, it's a lost opportunity to put something even healthier in our mouth. So if you want to know if something's healthy, you have to compare it to what you'd be eating instead. So, uh, for example, are eggs healthy, right? Uh, compared to breakfast link sausage? Yes. Uh, but compared to oatmeal? Not even close, right? I mean, but look, I mean, sausage is considered a group one carcinogen. In other words, we know consumption of processed meat causes cancer. Each 50 gram serving a day, uh, that's uh, uh, like a single breakfast link, was linked to an 18% higher risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, so the risk of getting colorectal cancer, eating one link a day, is about the same as the increased risk of lung cancer you'd get breathing secondhand smoke all day, living with a smoking spouse. So, uh, compared to sausage, eggs are healthy, but compared to oatmeal, eggs are not. So when it comes to Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger, yeah, they may be better in that they have you know, less saturated fat, but hey, you want less saturated fat? And plant-based meat alternatives are no match for unprocessed plant foods such as beans or lentils. A bean burrito, lentil soup, could certainly you know, fill the same culinary niche as a lunchtime burger, but if you are going to have some kind of burger, I mean, it's easy to argue that the plant-based versions are healthier. Right? There is a sodium issue, and it's not that much, if any, lower in saturated fat, since they use coconut oil, which is basically just as bad as animal fat, uh, there's not much advantage on that front. Though the total protein is similar across the board, does this matter? Or is there any advantage to eating plant protein over animal protein? Let's look at the association between animal and plant protein intake and mortality. In the twin Harvard cohorts, following more than 100,000 men and women over decades, after adjusting for other dietary and lifestyle factors, animal protein intake was associated with a higher risk of uh, mortality, particularly dying from cardiovascular disease, whereas higher plant protein intake was associated with a lower all-cause mortality, meaning a lower risk of dying from all causes put together. So replacing animal protein of various origins with plant protein was associated with lower mortality, especially if you're replacing processed meat and egg protein, which were the worst, uh, but when it comes to living a longer life, plant protein sources beat out each and every animal protein source, uh, not just better than bacon and eggs, but better than burgers, chicken, turkey, fish, and dairy protein. Together with other studies, these findings support the importance of protein sources for the long-term health outcomes, and suggest plants constitute a preferred protein source compared to animal foods. Why? Well, I mean, unlike animal protein, plant protein has not been associated with increased levels of the cancer-promoting growth hormone IGF-1, for example. Now, uh, soy protein is similar enough to animal protein that at high enough doses, like eating two Impossible Burgers a day, you may bump your IGF-1. But the only reason we care about IGF-1 is cancer risk, and if anything, higher soy intake is associated with a decreased risk of cancer. Uh, for example, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis found that soy protein intake was associated with a decreased risk in breast cancer mortality. We're talking a 12% reduction in breast cancer death associated with each 5 gram a day increase in soy protein intake. Uh, but the high soy groups in these studies were on the order of you know, more than 16 grams a day, associated with a whopping 62% lower risk of dying from breast cancer. Uh, more than 10 grams of soy protein a day may be good, associated with cutting breast cancer mortality risk nearly in half, and getting more than 16 grams a day may be better, which is like one impossible burger a day, but we simply don't know what happens at consumption levels far above that. Plant protein has also been linked to lower blood pressure, uh, reduced LDL cholesterol, and improved insulin sensitivity. No wonder substitution of plant protein for animal protein has been related to a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. Indeed, 21 different studies following nearly a half million people in high animal protein intakes were associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, where even just you know, moderate plant protein intake was associated with a decreased risk of type 2 diabetes. Okay, but these were just observational studies. They all tried to you know, control for other dietary and lifestyle factors, but you can't prove cause and effect until you put it to the test.
the effect of replacing animal protein with plant protein on blood sugar control in diabetes, a systematic review, a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, even just switching out about a third of your protein from animal to plant sources, yielded significant improvements in long-term blood sugar control and fasting, blood sugars and insulin. You can do the same thing looking at cholesterol. Here's a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials on the effect of plant protein on blood fats. And indeed, swapping in plant protein for animal protein decreases LDL cholesterol, and this benefit occurs whether you start out at high cholesterol or low cholesterol, whether you're swapping out dairy or meat and eggs, and uh, whether you're swapping in soy or other plant proteins. I, I mean, we've known about the beneficial effects on soy and cholesterol going back nearly 40 years, but you know, other sources of plant protein can do it as well. Yeah, but we're not swapping beans for beef. I mean, these products are mostly just isolated plant proteins, mostly you know, pea protein isolate in the case of uh, Beyond, and concentrated soy protein in the case of Impossible. Right? If you just isolate out the plant proteins themselves, are you still going to get benefits? Yes, surprisingly. Check it out. Interestingly, the researchers concluded that they did not find a significant difference between protein isolate products and whole food sources, suggesting that the cholesterol-lowering effects are, at least in part, attributable to the plant protein itself, rather than just the associated nutrients. And so it's not just because you know, plant protein travels with fiber or less saturated fat. Plant proteins break down into a different distribution of amino acids. So it's like if you give people arginine, an amino acid found more in plant foods, that alone can bring down people's cholesterol. And even plant protein concentrates used in these products aren't pure protein, uh, retaining a few active compounds such as phytosterols and antioxidants, which also can have beneficial effects. As noted in an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association on plant-based meat alternatives, uh, just looking at the nutrition facts info of a regular burger versus Beyond Meat or the Impossible Burger, you wouldn't necessarily be able to predict the health consequences without further studies. But we've had plant-based meat alternatives for over a century. I mean, who wouldn't want a can of good-eaten protose? It is, after all, the modern vegetable meat patent filed by Dr. John Harvey Kellogg in 1899. Of course, uh, products uh, such as tofu and tempeh have existed in Asia for centuries, but you know, I think of those as separate foods in their own right, as opposed to products intentionally designed to mimic the taste and texture of meat. Uh, with such a rich history, hearkening back to the days of past the proteina, you'd think there'd be some studies of consumers, and indeed there are. For example, girls who eat meat may start their periods six months earlier than girls who don't. Is it just because they're eating lots of uh, protein and fat? Evidently not, because girls who instead are eating meat analogs, like you know, veggie burgers and veggie dogs, are able to delay menstruation by nine months. Of course, it's hard to tease out how much of that is just from avoiding the meat, uh, but compared with girls who eat meat just a few times a week, those who ate meat a few times a day had a significantly early age of first menstruation, which also may help provide an explanation for why childhood meat consumption is linked to breast cancer later in life, since the earlier you start your period, the higher your lifetime risk. Now, Obesity itself may contribute to the early onset of puberty in girls, so I mean, that could be another factor. Studies have suggested vegetarian children tend to be leaner than non-vegetarian children. They aren't smaller in general, though. Vegetarian boys and girls may measure up to be about an inch taller than their classmates. They just aren't as wide. So the fact that girls who eat plant-based meats may be less likely to suffer from premature puberty may in part be because they were leaner. Indeed, childhood obesity research found meat consumption seemed to double the odds of school children becoming overweight compared to the consumption of plant-based meat. Now, whole plant food sources of protein, such as beans, did even better, though, associated with cutting in half the odds of kids becoming overweight. So that's why I consider these kinds of plant-based meats more of a useful stepping stone towards a healthier diet rather than the end game ideal. The same amount of protein in a bean burrito would be better in nearly every way. 
Similarly, in terms of hip fracture risk in the Adventist II study, following tens of thousands of men and women for years, daily intake of plant-based meats appeared to reduce the risk of hip fracture by nearly half. But daily legume intake, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, may drop risk of hip fracture by even more, nearly two-thirds. You may have heard about meat made out of wheat protein, meat made out of soybean protein, and meats made out of pea protein, but Mycoproteins, a relatively new addition, meat made from the mushroom kingdom popular in Europe, commercialized as corn, which makes not just meat-free beef, but chicken-free chicken, fishless fish, and pig-free pork, just in case someone would like to eat plant-based but can't give up their cocktail weenies. Environmental impact-wise, corn beef has at least a 10 times smaller carbon footprint than beef, corn chicken at least four times better than chicken chicken, and health-wise it's high in protein and fiber, low in fat, cholesterol, sodium, and sugar, as one would expect. But most importantly, there have been clinical trials showing it may help people control cholesterol, blood sugar, and insulin levels, and improve satiety. No surprise, given that not only the fiber, but the mycoprotein itself is fermentable by our good gut bugs, so can also act as a prebiotic for our friendly flora. There have been rare authenticated reports of people with mycoprotein allergies, and even more with unvalidated complaints, but you know, given how many billions of packages have been sold, the rate of allergic reactions may be on the order of like 1 in 9 million. Here's the cholesterol data converted into U.S. numbers. So significant drops in total in LDL cholesterol, more than 30 points within eight weeks. In terms of satiety, as I noted in my evidence-based weight loss presentation, both tofu and corn have been found to have satiating qualities that are stronger than chicken. For corn, uh, among both lean subjects and overweight and obese individuals, uh, cutting down on subsequent meal intake hours later. You know, it's funny, when the meat industry funds obesity studies on chicken, they choose for their head-to-head -head comparison foods like cookies and sugar-coated chocolates. This is a, a classic drug industry trick where you make your product look better by comparing it uh, against something worse. Apparently, just regular chocolate wasn't enough to make chicken look better. But you know what happens when chicken is pitted against a real control like chicken without the actual chicken? Chicken chickens out. For example, feed people a chicken and rice lunch, and four and a half hours later they eat 18% more of a dinner buffet than those instead who got a corn and rice lunch, cutting about 200 calories on average. Part of the reason plant-based meats may be less fattening is that they cause less of an insulin spike. A, a meat-free chicken like corn causes up to 41% less of an immediate insulin reaction. It turns out animal protein causes almost exactly as much insulin release as pure sugar. Just adding some egg whites to your diet can increase insulin output 60% within four days, and fish may be even worse. Why would adding tuna to mashed potatoes spike up insulin levels, but adding broccoli instead drop the insulin response by about 40%? It's not the fiber, since giving the same amount of broccoli fiber alone provided no significant benefit. So why does animal protein make things worse, but plant protein make things better? Uh, plant proteins tend to be lower in the branched-chain amino acids, which are associated with insulin resistance, the cause of type 2 diabetes. Uh, you can Show this experimentally. Like give some vegans branched-chain amino acids, and you make them as insulin-resistant as omnivores. Or take omnivores and put them through even a 48-hour vegan diet challenge, and within two days you can see the opposite significant improvements in metabolic signatures. Why? Because decreased consumption of branched-chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Check this out. Those randomized to restrict their protein intake were averaging literally hundreds more calories per day, so they should have become fatter, right? But no, they actually lost more body fat. Restricting their protein enabled them to eat more calories, while at the same time they lost more weight, more calories, yet a loss of body fat. And this magic protein restriction 
they were just having people eating the recommended amount of protein. Uh, so maybe they should have called this the normal protein group, or the recommended protein group, and the group that was eating uh, the more typical American protein levels and suffering because of it, the excess protein group. Given the restoration of metabolic health by decreased consumption of branched-chain amino acids, leaders in the field have suggested the invention of drugs to block their absorption, to promote metabolic health and treat diabetes and obesity without reducing caloric intake. Or we can just try not to eat so many branched-chain amino acids in the first place. They are found mostly in meat, including chicken and fish, dairy products, and eggs, perhaps explaining why animal protein has been associated with higher diabetes risk, whereas plant protein appears protected. So defining the appropriate upper limits of animal protein intake may offer a great chance for the prevention of type 2 diabetes and obesity. In an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association, the chair of nutrition at Harvard pointed out that you know, many plant-based meat alternatives, such as Beyond Meat and the Impossible Burger can be high in sodium, but an issue specific to the Impossible Burger was the heme, they add, derived from soybean plants to enhance the product's meaty flavor and appearance. Uh, safety analyses have failed to find any toxicity risk specific to the soy heme they have yeast churn out. Uh, the FDA has agreed, uh, both for use as a flavor and color enhancer, safe. In other words, just as safe as the heme found in blood and muscle and meat. But how much is that really saying? The concern raised in the op-ed, for example, was that higher intake of heme uh, has been associated with elevated risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But uh, not just diabetes killer number 7 in the United States. Higher dietary intake of heme iron is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease as well, killers number 1, 4, and 13, heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. But since heme is found mostly in meat, heme intake may just be a marker for meat intake. It's like diabetes. Three meta-analyses published today, and they all reported the same link. Uh, but there's lots of reasons why meat may increase diabetes risk, like advanced glycation end products produced when animal products are baked, broiled, grilled, fried, or barbecued. So how do we know that the heme isn't just some like innocent bystander? The same issue arises between the link between heme intake and increased breast cancer risk. Since heme iron is coming from animal foods, it could be any of the other meat components, like animal fat or, or meat mutagens, compounds in meat that can cause you know, DNA mutations. And hey, what about all the hormonal steroids implanted into cattle that may play a role in the development of breast cancer? A study in Japan found that beef imported from the United States contained up to 600 times the level of estrogens like estradiol, U.S. beef, Japanese beef and higher consumption of estrogen-rich beef due to hormone implantation may facilitate estrogen accumulation in the human body, and thus affecting women's risk for breast cancer. So yeah, heme iron intake was associated with breast cancer risk, but maybe that's just because the heme and the hormones are traveling together in the same package, meat. This is about as good as any observational study can do. The NIH AERP study is the largest prospective study on diet and health ever, following more than a half million men and women for over a decade now. With such a huge data set, they could take advantage of the fact that different meats have different amounts of heme, so they could try to tease out the heme components by, in effect, comparing people eating different amounts of heme but the same amount of meat to see if heme is independently associated with disease. And indeed, that's what they showed, an independent association not only from nitrites and processed meat, but heme and mortality uh, from almost all causes. Death from diabetes, heart disease, stroke, respiratory disease, kidney disease, liver disease, cancer, and all causes put together. They calculated that about one-fifth of the association between like, you know, eating burgers and the shortening of your lifespan could be statistically accounted for by just the heme itself. But that's assuming cause and effect. Right? Even an independent association is still an association. You can't prove cause and effect until you put it to the test in interventional studies. Normally, we don't necessarily 
care about the mechanism. I mean, when the World Health Organization designated bacon, ham, hot dogs, luncheon meat, sausage to be group 1 carcinogens, meaning we know these products cause cancer in human beings, I mean, who cares? If it's the hemine, or the heterocyclic aromatic amines, or the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or the N-nitrosamines, they're all wrapped up in the same place, processed meat, which we know causes cancer, so we should just try to stay away from it, regardless of the mechanism. But with the advent of the Impossible Burger, we really do have to know, because for the first time we have lots of heme without any actual meat. So we need to know if the heme itself is harmful. For that, we'll have to turn to interventional studies, which we'll cover next. In muscle meat, there's a heme protein that contributes to the meaty taste of meat. Uh, well, there's a heme protein in the roots of soybean plants, too, that can be churned out to provide a similar flavor and aroma in plant-based meat, which is used to make the impossible burger possible. The question is, are there any downsides? When the European Food Safety Authority was considering the safety of adding heme iron to foods, uh, their main concern was the potential increased risk of colon cancer. I mean, we know meat causes cancer. Processed meat, bacon, ham, hot dogs, lunch meat, sausage, is considered a group 1 carcinogen, meaning we know it causes cancer in people, with the same level of certainty that something like smoking causes cancer, whereas something like a, a burger just probably causes cancer in people, kind of like DDT. But what's the role of heme iron? I mean, there's all sorts of potential mechanisms to explain the cancer risk. Meat's got the pro-inflammatory long-chain omega-6 arachidonic acid, more of the aging and cancer-associated methionine, trans fat, endogenous hormones like IGF-1, not to mention the ones that are implanted in animals as hormonal growth promoters. Then there's all the toxic pollutants that build up the food chain, like uh, pesticides. I, mean, I didn't even know about the formaldehyde. According to the prestigious IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, there is strong evidence that heterocyclic amines, heterocyclic aromatic amines, contribute to the cancer-causing mechanism. These DNA-damaging compounds are formed when muscle tissue is exposed to high, dry heat. Grilling, roasting, baking, broiling, basically anything above steaming or stewing. There is also strong evidence that the formation of so-called N-nitroso compounds contribute to the cancer-causing mechanism. These are carcinogens that can form inside our gut when we eat the meat, but there is also strong evidence, according to the IARC, that heme iron contributes to the cancer-causing mechanism. Now, normally, I might leave it there, but other authoritative bodies I respect, like the American Institute for Cancer Research and the World Cancer Research Fund, are more tentative. Uh, well, they agree there is some evidence that the consumption of foods containing heme iron might increase the risk of colorectal cancer. They consider the evidence suggesting such a connection to be limited. Uh, much of the available evidence is based on lab animal data, such as this, in which uh, dietary heme was found to disrupt the gut flora, aggravate in inflammation, and potentiate the development of intestinal tumors in mice. But it's, it's critical to note that in all the laboratory animal models that have been used, the rodents ingested meat or heme equivalent to people eating up to 40,000 pounds of meat a day. I mean, even the smallest dose would be like you know, a dozen impossible burgers a day. Right? It's easy to see how casual readers could get confused, though, in this study, ascribing a central role for heme iron in the colon cancer development associated with meat, the authors claimed they were aimed at determining at nutritional doses, which was the main factor involved in cancer promotion. So doses of heme were chosen to mimic red meat consumption and, boom, significant increase in tumor load. The researchers include that their findings strongly suggest that at concentrations that are in line with human meat consumption, heme iron is associated with the promotion of colon cancer development. But if you look at the actual diet they were given, and do the math, that's 500 times the level of heme found in people's diet, in excess of like 70 pounds of meat a day. Of course, even if they really did use the right doses, they're still going to end up with data on the wrong species, which brings us to clinical studies 
which we'll explore next. In a review attempting to downplay the role of heme in the link between meat and cancer, funded by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, they noted that it's important to remember that all the rat-and-mouse studies suggesting harm from heme didn't evaluate exposure conditions that were representative of any kind of like, realistic human exposures. Instead, the rats were given heme at levels corresponding to up to you know, 360,000 times the level of meat recommended in the dietary guidelines. But you know, hey, at least you know what might happen if you ate 20 tons of meat a day, and were a rodent. What about the human studies? Heme iron can promote the formation of N nitroso compounds. Why should we care about the diet induced formation of these compounds in our gut? Because a number of these compounds are known to cause DNA damage. In fact, one of them, methyl nitrosourea, is actually used to induce colon cancer. And at higher levels of meat consumption, concentrations of apparent total nitroso compounds were found to be on the same order as the concentration of N-nitroso compounds in cigarette smoke. OK, but that was at like two to four burgers a day worth of meat. At like a half a burger a day, people were pooping out no more than nitroso compounds than those eating none. Uh, going from a half burgers worth to four burgers a day gives you a big spike, but you know, cutting out meat completely just brought you down to about you know, half burger levels. What about just like normal meat consumption, like one burger a day? It's not just two or four burgers worth that can do it. One quarter pounder can also do it. And that looks to be about where levels start shooting up. That's one potential way heme iron may play a major role in colorectal cancer promotion, the N-nitroso pathway. The other is fat peroxidation, oxidized fat that may also lead to mutagenic DNA damage. Just a few days eating just like a burger a day significantly increased the biomarker of fat oxidation in people's stool. How do we know whether it's the heme itself that's responsible for both these processes? Well, if you give people a heme supplement alone, you can increase fecal levels, whereas a non-heme iron supplement appeared to have no effect. A bump with heme iron, but back down on non-heme iron, suggesting it's the N-nitroso compounds from the ingestion of heme that may be accounting for the increased cancer risk. But that so-called heme supplement wasn't a supplement at all. They just fed people like four ounces of liver pate and blood sausage. So this should be labeled like this, in which case no big revelation. And the same thing with fat oxidation. Was it the heme itself or any number of other things found in a blood sausage diet? The best evidence we have that heme itself is playing a role is that if you remove the heme, you can get a significant drop in N-nitroso compound formation, but note it was only about a quarter, so there must be other factors. And indeed, there was a strong correlation with the amount of nitrites in their stool, which can be involved directly in the production, or found in both processed and, to a lesser extent, unprocessed meat. Now, Soy appears to have a significant suppressive effect on fecal and nitroso concentrations. That piqued my interest, since the trigger for my whole deep dive into heme was Impossible Foods attempt to recreate the taste of meat using a plant-based heme protein in place of the muscle-based heme protein. Uh, the company likes to say how the heme in Impossible Burger is atom for atom identical to the heme found in meat, and so would be expected to have similar effects. But if soy can have a mediating effect, since the Impossible Burger is a soy-based burger, maybe that changes things. They had people eat a high meat diet with and without soy, and got about a 40% drop in the concentration of those potentially carcinogenic compounds eating the same amount of meat when the soy was added. Now, it turns out they didn't end up making much less. It's just that they boosted their fecal output by about 40%, about a 40% bigger stool size because they're eating about a half a cup of soybeans. But that's good because bigger poops mean lower carcinogen concentrations and reduced intestinal transit time, all resulting in less potential carcinogen contact with the bowel wall. Uh, but this was because they used whole soybeans, which would give them like you know, six grams of fiber, whereas the Impossible Burger only has about half that, since it's made from a more of a soy protein concentrate. The question of safety then becomes, 
whether or not the N-nitroso compounds formed in our intestines as a result of the heme are DNA damaging or cancer causing. Uh, when you see the term ATNC, that stands for apparent total N-nitroso compounds, uh, measuring just a nonspecific broad class of compounds, some of which are uh, definitely genotoxic and carcinogenic, but further work is required to establish that the specific ones that pop up when we eat meat, further work that we'll turn to next. U.S. patent 9,700,067 was Impossible Foods' dream of improving plant-based meat substitutes to better replicate the aromas and flavors of meat by using plant-based heme. OK, but what about the heme-induced formation of nitroso compounds? Uh, when we eat lots of meat, you can pick up more and more nitroso compounds in people's poop, a small fraction of which may be due directly to the heme. The toxicological significance of this remains to be established, since only some nitroso compounds are of concern. But should the nitroso compounds formed in the intestine as a result of heme consumption be shown to be mutagenic or carcinogenic, uh, this might help explain the association between red meat consumption and colorectal cancer. But you don't know until you put it to the test. DNA damage is considered an essential component of the development of colonic cancer, so researchers looked at fecal water genotoxicity. You've heard of green tea, black tea. This is more like brown tea, basically a filtered fecal smoothie. That's definitely one where you want to double-check the blender lids on type. But what they found was that the DNA-damaging effects of the fecal water was independent of the amount of nitroso compounds they found. Now, the lack of correlation between the apparent total nitroso compound concentrations and DNA damage could be uh, due to much lower levels of nitroso compounds found in fecal water uh, compared to the feces themselves. I mean, just looking at the fecal water, the nitroso compounds are kind of the same across meat groups, but the real poop had the real scoop. Ideally, though, we'd like to know what's happening in the human colon. So, researchers took biopsies before and after a week that included a few daily servings of beef and veal. And not only did they see more than a two-fold increase in fecal water genotoxicity that correlated with procarcinogenic gene expression changes in the kind of before and after biopsy specimens after just one week. Still, there's only been circumstantial evidence that the N-nitroso compounds formed in the large bowel after eating meat may be important genotoxins until now, or at least until this study. A significant increase in nitroso compounds significantly correlated with a significant increase in DNA damage characteristic of N-nitroso genotoxicity. You can visualize the DNA damage in rectal biopsies. The brown standing on the right after a month of three beef and lamb servings a day? The researchers suggest dietary heme as a reasonable explanation, uh, but the lowest dose of heme showing evidence of direct DNA damage, in this case from freshly resected colon tissue, was 10 micromoles. I, I contacted Impossible, and they said that's equivalent to three times the concentration of heme found in their burgers. Uh, after completing this deep dive, therefore, it's not clear to me that heme at typical dietary doses causes harm, and even less clear that heme is a culprit in the meat and cancer connection. If it's not the heme, though, what is it? Well, there's reasons to suspect involvement of bovine infectious factors in colorectal cancer. There are heat-resistant, tumor-causing viruses that could survive meat cooked medium or rare, a specific class of infectious agents that have been isolated from both cows and around human colon cancer tissue, not to mention the brains of MS victims. What do breast and colorectal cancers and multiple sclerosis all have in common? Several potentially infectious factors from cattle blood and milk, but that's a whole video topic in and of itself. Less speculatively, it could just be the saturated and trans fats or sulfur-containing amino acids concentrated in the meat interacting with our gut microbes, resulting in oxidative stress and inflammation that drives the cancer. If you compare the gut bacteria, 
in stools from cancer patients to healthy subjects, a high meat to fruit and veggie ratio appears to associate with outgrowth of bacteria that might contribute to a more hostile gut environment. A hunt for global microbial signatures that are specific for colorectal cancer suggested the metabolic link between cancer-associated gut microbes and a fat and meat-rich diet. Uh, maybe it's from the meat putrefying in your colon. Uh, putrefaction inside the human gastrointestinal tract pertains to decomposition of undigested proteins in the gut. Uh, some of the products of this uh, putrefication process, like ammonia, uh, putrescine, and uremic toxins like cresol, indole, and phenol, have been implicated in the development of colorectal cancer. But cut out the meat, and levels of some of these compounds may fall by more than half, perhaps because they cultivated fewer putrefying bacteria. Bad bacteria also produce secondary bile acids, which are associated with both cancer risk and cancer progression as a potential promoter of colorectal tumor enlargement, in part by damaging the intestinal lining, cause, causing a, a leaky gut. Uh, put people on a diet packed with animal foods, and you get a massive increase in the bacterial production within days, whereas if you cut meat, you can go the other way. Even just eating more plant-based, swapping out the standard American diet for healthier fare, remarkably reduced secondary bile acids by 70% within just two weeks. There also might be a strong link between colorectal cancer and trimethylamine anoxide, TMAO, a gut microbial metabolite of dietary meat and fat. Uh, maybe that's the link between what our gut bugs are doing with meat and risk of colorectal cancer. Maybe because of the inflammation caused by TMAO, but it could also be the oxidative stress, or, or DNA damage, or, or protein disruption. What about the non-human sialic acid, known as uh, NU5GC, which is incorporated into the tissues of, of meat consumers and elicits an inflammatory immune reaction? And antibody levels against this foreign compound found in meat are associated with colorectal cancer risk. One could go on and on. The bottom line, health-wise, is that while nutrition experts are understandably concerned you're going to be ordering that impossible Whopper with fries and a Coke. Hey, it's better than getting fries and a Coke with the regular Whopper.